Well, welcome back for the second session of our, our course here on uh, witnessing to people involved in cults and other religions. Uh, thank you very much for coming. And this afternoon we're going to deal with the topic of Mormonism. Mormonism is probably the largest of the uh, cults of Christianity, and it's uh, one that is uh, very thoroughly indigenous to the United States, although it is now growing <coughs> around the world. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to be speaking to you, uh, trying to keep my comments about this fairly closely tied to the treatment of Mormonism in this book by my old friend, Kurt Van Gordon, just simply called Mormonism. It is part of the Zondervan uh, Guide to Cults and Religious Movements. And uh, Kurt has been a, uh, an evangelist to the Mormons for over 40 years now. A wonderful uh, ministry that he has in uh, Utah, Utah Gospel Mission. And uh, <clears throat> he has spoken there and around the world, and uh, he is in pretty much daily uh, activity witnessing to Mormons. So I was very grateful that uh, Zondervan was able to get him to do this particular volume. He, he writes on the subject with uh, very uh, good understanding. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, just giving you a very brief sketch of Mormon history, um, broken into some pieces here, uh, beginning with its founding by Joseph Smith, uh, who lived from 1804 to 1844. Um, uh, Smith was something of a mystic. Um, he and his father were also treasure hunters around uh, upstate New York. Uh, don't necessarily take that as pejorative. Lots of people were treasure hunters in upstate New York in those days. There were many rumors, uh, legends, about treasures buried in the hills of that area, tied to a number of different uh, rumors and legends about the origins of the uh, Native Americans, the, uh, the American Indians. And so, so treasure hunting, hunting actually became something of a respectable occupation. And many people were involved in that, but uh, Joseph and his father both were in that. Uh, and in the 1820s, from 1820 to 1827, Smith uh, claims to have had many religious visions and experiences. Um, he says that at one point, uh, he prayed to God and asked him uh, of all the various denominations which one he should join, which one was true, and God's answer to him was that they were all wrong and he should join none of them and that God would use him to uh, restore the gospel that had been completely lost after the apostolic age. Uh, he claimed that an angel by the name of Moroni uh, showed him golden plates buried in the hill Cumora in upstate New York, uh, bearing writing on them, engraved on them in a language called Reformed Egyptian, and that the writing was the text of what became known as the Book of Mormon. Now, archeologists will tell you that there is no such thing as Reformed Egyptian, uh, but that's just one of the many uh, difficulties with Smith's history and Mormonism's history. He claimed to have been uh, anointed by God as a priest to restore uh, lost Christianity to earth. Uh, that supposedly happened in 1829. And then in 1830, he translated the Book of Mormon from the text engraved on the golden plates uh, which uh, have never been seen by anybody since then, uh, but he translated the Book of Mormon from that text into the English language. Interestingly, uh, much of it is in Elizabethan English, uh, which was uh, the dominant English of Bible speakers in those days because of the influence of the authorized version or the King James translation that came out in 1611. Um, Joseph Smith did not know Reformed Egyptian. He didn't claim to know Reformed Egyptian. Instead, he claimed that he was able to translate 
by using uh, devices called Urim and Thummim. These were words taken out of Mosaic literature and they were, they were articles of priests' clothing. But for Smith, they became uh, sort of a, a, a translucent stone through which if he looked at the golden plates, what came through was translated into English for him and then his job became basically just that of, of, uh, of uh, transcriber. Of, of what was there. Um, the, the concept of Urim and Thummim in the Old Testament is not at all similar to that. Uh, they were used by the priests as a part of their, uh, their ritual in communing with God and seeking uh, him out for, for uh, guidance and wisdom, but they certainly didn't have this sort of a, a you know, magic vision thing that enabled them to translate anything. Um, <clears throat> Joseph Smith, uh, Smith founded the Mormon Church, or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, in uh, 1830. The initial name was simply the Church of Jesus Christ, uh, but there were a number of others that went by that name, and so later on he added the, uh, the rest of the name. In 1830, and then in 1831, he published his own version of the Bible, the uh, Joseph Smith's uh, inspired version of the Bible. Uh, this was not so much a translation as a Bible that he had emended in various ways to fit better with his beliefs. Um, he uh, claimed to have received continuing revelations throughout 1833 to 1834, and then as the prophet and president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, he continued to be the authoritative spokesman for God uh, until his death uh, in 1844. Uh, he, was, uh, he was killed uh, in 1844 outside a jail in Carthage, Illinois. Uh, Mormons refer to this as his martyrdom what had happened was that he had been charged with inciting a riot after he and colleagues had ordered a newspaper office destroyed because the newspaper had printed critical comments about him and the Mormon movement. Uh, he was arrested, he was jailed, and an angry mob stormed the jail. And uh, Smith had been uh, provided a, uh, a pistol smuggled into him in the jail, and uh, he, uh, he came out gunning, but he was outgunned and uh, was killed on June 27, 1844. That is Joseph Smith's martyrdom. He was succeeded by uh, Brigham Young, who became the second president and prophet of the Mormon Church. He lived from 1801 to 1877. Smith's was a fairly short life. Brigham Young's was a very long life for those days. And uh, uh, he replaced Smith as prophet in 1844. He led the Mormon pioneers to the Great Salt Lake Valley in Utah in 1847. And he essentially ruled there um, as uh, almost an autocratic despot uh, in Utah until his death in 1877. Uh, following him, there has been a succession of 14 prophets or presidents of the Mormon Church. The president is always known as the prophet for the time that he is in office. He speaks for God, and when he is speaking officially, his word is the very word of God. And so it is all carefully recorded, it's, it's kept, uh, in the Journal of Discourses and in other places, and that way they have this on record. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to try to go through all of those 14, I'll just mention that that was what happened. Now there have been some important turning points in Mormon history. We can look first at what's simply called the Mormon, Mormon War. Uh, Missouri mobs had harassed Mormons and Mormons formed a band of what they called destroying angels to retaliate, retaliate against them. Uh, men were killed on both sides in August and October of 1838. 
Uh, and the whole thing ended with a massacre-style attack by 200 uh, federal troops on 20 Mormons, uh, with 17 of the Mormons killed. Um, that is what uh, really anticipated or, or precipitated their movement from Missouri to Utah. Uh, next major turning point was what is called the Utah War, which took place in 1857. This was a contest, really, between uh, the United States President uh, James Buchanan and Utah Territorial Governor uh, Brigham Young, who was also president of the Mormon Church. Uh, Young resisted the president's order to appoint non-Mormons to the territorial government, and Buchanan sent an army battalion to try to enforce his order. Uh, that led to war between them. Um, there were not pitched battles, but one thing that the Mormons did was they, they plundered the cattle and feedstock of the army uh, troops, and that led actually by itself to the deaths of several hundred uh, American military men there in Utah, and eventually the military essentially gave up trying to, uh, to force the Mormons into submission there. The next one was what is referred to as the Mountain Meadows Massacre in 1857. Uh, there was a wagon train of settlers uh, headed uh, from uh, mostly in Arkansas to California in uh, the early, uh, well, in, in part of the, the gold rush days. And they went through Utah, and the Mormons didn't much like them going through Utah, and in a location called Mountain Meadows, the Mormons disguised themselves as Indians <clears throat> and attacked the wagon train and uh, massacred about 120 people there. Also important in Mormon history as a, a turning point was the, the issue of polygamy its beginning and its ending. Mormons practiced polygamy from 1842 to uh, 1890, and actually probably at least Joseph Smith and Brigham Young began practicing it before 1842 because granted the number of wives that Smith had by the time he died, it's unlikely that he would have, had, would have married that many of them in just the last two years before his death. About 15 to 20 percent of Mormons in that period practiced polygamy. The uh, Latter-day Saints officially approved of polygamy, and that delayed Utah's admission as, uh, admission as a state into the Union, uh, because in those days the federal government somehow or other considered that marriage should be between one man and one woman. Uh, not multiple, and uh, somehow or other they, they thought that federal government had something to say about that. Smith himself had 27 wives, Young had 53. Um, congressional legislation and, and opposition by women's groups led to, uh, to new revelation by Prophet Wilford Woodruff in 1890 that Mormons should stop practicing polygamy. Uh, nonetheless, a number of people in Mormon splinter groups do still practice polygamy, and even uh, in, in other countries where polygamy is not illegal, uh, Mormon people in the actual Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, some of them still practice polygamy. So there you had the turning point of 1890 when this new revelation came from God, uh, rather conveniently following upon the federal legislation, and uh, opening the door for Utah to become a state. And then <clears throat> one more is that uh, from 1830 to 1978, the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, and other of its uh, divine, divine scriptures uh, said that, uh, and they still say this, but uh, Mormons have uh, achieved some ways of beginning to ignore it, but the Book of Mormon and the Pearl of Great Price say that Indians and blacks' dark skin is due to a curse by God, uh, and that that disqualified them from receiving the Mormon priesthood. 
And in uh, 1978, the Mormon president, prophet Spencer W. Kimball, received a new revelation <coughs> on June 9, permitting blacks and, and Indians to enter the priesthood. Uh, that um, little by little reduced the, uh, the um, stigma uh, of the Mormon church as a basically racist organization. We're going to see a little later as we talk about Mormon beliefs, particularly about the doctrine of man, just how integrally that idea of different races and some being cursed fit into the whole system of Mormon theology. It was not incidental. Now, just a few statistics for you. Uh, most of these are as of 2012. A few come from a few years before that because they hadn't been updated. Uh, and these mostly come directly from uh, Mormon Church official statistical reports. Worldwide membership uh, as of the end of 2012 was uh, reported at 14.8 million. Uh, of those, 59,000 were serving as missionaries. Now, in the Mormon church, if you're a young man, you are expected to go on a two-year mission beginning at age 19, and you should stay on that mission for, for a two-year period. That's part of why they field such an enormous number of missionaries compared with their uh, total, total membership numbers as a, as a ratio. Uh, very few denominations come anywhere near that kind of a ratio. But remember, the vast majority of these are on mission for two years, period. That's it. And they never return to the mission field after that. Um, there are 141 temples. Uh, temples are very ornate buildings. They are uh, they're reserved for special uses. First of all, endowment ceremonies, eternal marriages, baptisms for the dead. Those are done only in temples. They cannot be done in congregations or, or stakes or wards, anything of that sort. They have to be done in the Mormon temples. And uh, uh, they're also when you, when you uh, go into the temple and, and take part in the rituals there, you have to be wearing holy garments. Um, and actually, uh, these garments have to have holes in them to be properly holy. And I won't go into the discussion of why all of that is the case. There is a lot of symbolism and ceremony in Mormonism that is borrowed from Freemasonry. And in fact, Joseph Smith was a, uh, a member of the Masonic Lodge. That was also, by the way, extremely common in late colonial and early Republican uh, America in the, in the colonies and states. Um, and uh, Freemasonry is very, very religious. It has, it has a major doctrinal system. And those who tell you that Freemasonry is just a matter of you know, a community service club kind of organization, uh, they're either not being honest or they are very, very new to Masonry and have, have not begun to study it in any depth. But uh, the Mormon church borrowed a whole lot of masonry symbols and ceremonies and those figure in temple worship in the Mormon church. Um, there are 29,000 congregations of the Mormon church around the world, four universities and colleges. Uh, they have translated their, their uh, church materials into 177 languages and their annual income is something in the range of $7 billion. Uh, most of that comes from tithes, but they also have large church uh, investment holdings. The Marriott Hotel, Hotel chain is owned by Mormons, and a tithe of everything that the Marriott chain brings in goes to the Mormon church. And there's an irony there too, in that Mormonism condemns the drinking of alcohol, and at least, Anyway, 25 years or so ago, maybe 30 years ago, the Marriott chain was one of the biggest sellers of alcohol in the United States. So a significant part of Mormonism's income comes from the sale of alcohol through Marriott hotels. And uh, 
Uh, I suppose they could explain that as, as uh, plundering the Egyptians, right? All right, now let's just talk about a few basic practices, customs, and values in the Mormon church. Uh, Kurt does go into more of these in his book, but I just wanted to bring a few to the fore. One is tithing. Mormon, uh, Mormon doctrine requires all members to tithe, and there is, in fact, accountability about that. Uh, this is one of the reasons that the income is so high on a per capita basis in the Mormon church. Um, uh, in, in Christian churches as a whole in the United States, average annual giving per member is uh, down somewhere in the 2 to 3 percent uh, of income range. For the Mormon church, it is very nearly a solid 10 percent. So that means the average Mormon is giving uh, from five to uh, three and a half times what the average church member gives in tithing. Uh, that's a, that's a uh, that should be, I suppose it should in part be a rebuke to us, but it also should help us to understand how committed people need to be in order to remain in the Mormon church. And uh, we should have a lot of respect for that. We should recognize these are, these are people who take very seriously their commitment to the Mormon church. And frankly, they put a lot of us to shame. Uh, our realization of that should affect how we relate to them. We need to never minimize their sincerity, their, their integrity, their honor. These tend to be, Mormons tend to be, people of very significant commitment. Another major practice for them is restrictions on food and drink. They are not to have any hot drinks. Um, by the way, Mormonism does not forbid drinking coffee. But, it, uh, but because coffee is almost always served hot, the vast majority of Mormons never come to drink coffee. But it's a fairly common perception that Mormonism forbids drinking coffee. It does forbid using tobacco and alcohol and uh, it urges only sparing consumption of meat. So uh, Mormons actually tend to have pretty healthy diets uh, by comparison with the rest of the American uh, population. And then finally, a major uh, part of Mormon culture is simply family. And this is in fact one of the ways in which the Mormon church most promotes itself to the public. Uh, you may have seen commercials on television about the wonder of Mormon families and uh, how strong and healthy they are. Um, <clears throat> you may have seen billboards about it. They use billboards, commercials, and so on to promote this. It's one of the most attractive things about Mormonism for many people. Uh, my understanding is that that is a major part of why Glenn Beck converted to Mormonism. He married a Mormon woman, and by the way, in the Mormon church, you are not discouraged from marrying Gentiles, that's non-Mormons, you're encouraged to do it because that's evangelistic marriage. Rather interesting in that the Bible really clearly teaches that marriages should be between fellow believers. That's very clear in, in Mosaic law, but it's also clear in the New Testament where Paul says, for, in, for instance, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 14, uh, that, uh, that uh, there should be no uh, link between light and darkness, that we can't have this kind of a partnership. That's too many gods under one roof. But frankly, if you're already a polytheist, I guess you can get along with that. And Mormonism is thoroughly polytheistic. Well, Mormonism promotes having large families, and that too is rooted in its theology, its theology of man as well as its theology of God. We'll see about how that works uh, in a little while. It very heavily values adoption. So many Mormons adopt as well as having plenty of their own children. Uh, so they have a reputation for strong families. Uh, Ross Duthit, writing in the New York Times just last year, said the state of Utah has one of the lowest abortion rates in the country and one of the lowest rates of out of wedlock births which entails that there aren't an awful lot of out-of-wedlock pregnancies going on either. So there's clearly a lot of success in promoting chastity in the Mormon church. It has a high marriage rate, a relatively low divorce rate, 
and the highest birth rate, despite a low teen pregnancy rate, of any state. An America that looked more like Utah would have more intact families, less child poverty, fewer abortions, and for that matter, a better fiscal outlook as the baby boomers retire. We are, by the way, headed for demographic winter. If you ever get an opportunity, Google that, demographic winter, and view the video there uh, about how much of the uh, Western world is headed toward economic collapse as working age population shrinks relative to retired age and young dependent age population. Uh, it's going to be very, very difficult to keep economies uh, moving. Um, so that's, that's an important thing to, to recognize. Utah w will not have that problem. Most of the other states in America will have that problem, and most of the countries of the, the developed, the Western, the democratic world will have that problem in spades. And by the way, most of the rest of the world will have that problem too, just a little bit later, because they moved into the declining birth rate period later than did the West. I, I get aside there into one of my other specialties. Um, <clears throat> back, uh, back in the 1960s and 70s, many apologists would point out that in fact, Utah had one of the highest divorce rates. And that was the case then, uh, but the Mormon church could still declare at that point that Mormons had a very low divorce rate. Why? Because at that point, if you got divorced, you were no longer Mormon. So there just weren't many divorcees in the Mormon church. Uh, but the, the high divorce rate for the state of Utah uh, turned around after that. All right, now there are also a number of related groups to the Mormon church. I'm going to mention just one major one and then uh, make reference to small ones. The Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was founded shortly after Joseph Smith's death and basically it was a split off of people who didn't accept Brigham Young's uh, takeover of the presidency and, and prophetic office. Uh, that number's about 240,000 people. They are mostly in Missouri and surrounding states, and they tend to, uh, to hold much more closely to Joseph Smith's original teachings and not to have been affected much by later teaching by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And then there are a number of fundamentalist splinter groups uh, of all sorts. Most of these are polygamous, uh, polygamist clans uh, who rejected Spencer Kimball's revelation in 1890 that, uh, that said that Mormons should stop practicing polygamy. Um, and there are about 30,000 people altogether in these various different polygamist splinter groups. Now we're going to talk a bit about church structure and government in Mormonism. Structure first, um, there are four basic levels in the Mormon church in terms of its structure. Uh, first are branches. These are local congregations of under 200 members, typically under 200 members. Some of them will go a little bit larger than that, but the aim is when you get much larger than that, you form a ward, a local congregation uh, consisting of 200 to 800 members. And then above that are stakes. Those are collections of five to 12 wards. And then above those are areas, geographical districts of stakes, wards, and branches all brought together. There's almost a sort of a Presbyterian structure inherent in that Mormon structure there. Uh, it indicates uh, some of the influence of, of Presbyterian uh, teaching on particularly the rural upstate New York area, which was very powerful in Joseph Smith's uh, formative years in his late teens and his early 20s. Church government in the Mormon church, we'll, we'll look at that from top down. The, the, at the top is the first presidency. That is the president and two counselors. Uh, all of them are considered to be living oracles of God, but the president particularly is the prophet while he is uh, in office, and that is uh, a, an office for life. Um, next under them is the Council of Twelve Apostles. This is uh, the, the head 
of the Council of Twelve Apostles usually succeeds to the presidency on the death of the prior president. Under that are the first and second quorums of the Seventy. Originally there was only one quorum of the Seventy and then they just simply found that there was much too much to be done so they counted, they created a second quorum of the Seventy. Uh, these are sort of modeled on the Sanhedrin of, uh, of um, rabbinic synagogue Judaism and on the 70 elders of Moses' time and on the 70 witnesses whom Christ sent out uh, for evangelism during his ministry. So that's where they get the notion of this quorum of, of 70. Um, they assist in uh, administration and they are the traveling representatives of the church. They do most of the the work of going around to different places and explaining what Mormonism is about, putting on the public face for Mormonism. Under them is the presiding bishopric. These are three men who provide, preside over all bishops worldwide. They have authority over temporal affairs in the LDS Church uh, and over the collection of tithes from stakes and the distribution of funds for the poor and also over the design of stake centers, remembering that a stake was a collection of five to 12 wards, which was in turn a collection of congregations. And then under them are, uh, I'm sorry, not under them, but rather the, the whole thing is wrapped together in what are called the general authorities. The general authorities of the Mormon church are all of the above, and they are the only representatives who can act officially in the name of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, they make decisions on doctrine, and their decisions on doctrine are considered binding until changed. <laughs> kind of like our laws in Congress, you know? <laughs> okay. uh, no Congress, no, no uh, legislature can bind a future legislature, I suppose. All right, so there you've got a little bit in terms of Mormon history and structure and, and uh, its administration and so on. Now let's start looking at Mormon theology. And we start with sources of authority. There are standard works, which are the Bible, and Mormons prefer the authorized version uh, with footnotes from Smith's version. But frankly, most of them don't read the Bible very much either, which unfortunately probably doesn't distinguish them terribly much from most Protestants or Roman Catholics, but uh, they, they don't tend to refer to it a lot. They don't tend to try to make the case for their beliefs out of it, which is not surprising in that so many of their beliefs are entirely foreign to it. Uh, another is the Book of Mormon, which has been slightly revised, not major revisions, but slight revisions have been made to it a number of different times, most recently in 1981. That is not considered to be beneath the Bible, that is above the Bible, because in Mormon theology, later revelation always supersedes earlier revelation. So that's why a Spencer Kimball could pronounce that he had a prophecy in 1890 banning polygamy, whereas Brigham Young had very vociferously taught the rightness of polygamy, and it even had a, a, a root in the Mormon understanding of why we need to have lots of children. Because there are all of these disembodied spirits who are the sons and daughters of, 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 the very, of, of the God of this planet, and they need to become embodied so that they can go through their probation in order to become gods and goddesses. So who better to provide bodies for them to grow up in than we Mormons who will then you know, be able to prepare them for their, their probation, right? So that's a part of why they actually taught polygamy for that period of time. Uh, the, the Doctrine and Covenants, or the Book of Commandments of 1833 was revised in 1920 and 1982. Uh, these started out as Joseph Smith's writings and they're still basically what Joseph Smith said. And then also the Pearl of Great Price which was revised in 1851 and 1982. So, Bible, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, those are the, what they refer to as the standard works, right? Now, in addition to the standard works, they have the general authorities, and remember the general authorities 
are the first presidency and the, you know, the council, and the, the apostles, the, the uh, quorums of the 70 and so on. All of those are the general authorities. So those are, are included among the sources of authority in the Mormon church. So there are the general authorities and there is the continual revelation. The words of the current prophet, the first president, are inspired and they are as binding as scripture and they can overrule any previous prophet or teaching in the standard works. Um, there are four different types of revelation for Mormons. There's prophecy, that's the bulk of Doctrine and Covenants, one of those standard works. There is visions, um, uh, parts of the Doctrine of Co and Covenants and parts of the Pearl of Great Price. There are inspired speeches. These are conference speeches by general authorities. And it's not always clear whether a given speech is understood to be inspired or not. And that seems, it seems to, uh, to morph as to whether at the moment the whole church embraces what he has said or has come to not embrace it anymore, in which case you can look back and say, oh, well, he wasn't inspired when he said that. We'll look at a few examples of that kind of thing in a little bit. And then um, they also attempt to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, the, the fourth type of revelation is called the gift and power of God to translate. And this was the gift specifically to Joseph Smith uh, to, uh, to produce the Book of Mormon and parts of the Pearl of Great Price, as well as his inspired version of the Bible. That was that type of revelation from God. Now, um, the Mormons have all sorts of ways in which they will argue for their types of authority. And I'm not going to go into great depths on them, but I'll mention just three. Uh, first of all, the canon of Scripture for Mormonism is the canon of Scripture was not closed at the end of the apostolic period. More could be added to Scripture at any given time. Uh, so that uh, Joseph Smith said, modern revelation is necessary. If we are permitted to believe that he, that is God, has spoken, we must and do believe that he continues to speak because he is unchangeable. Right? Notice his argument there. God is unchangeable. He once spoke, therefore he must still speak. Right? Now, let's try what's called in logic a reductio ad absurdum. Let's take the same structure of argument but put in a different premise. God is unchangeable. He once created the earth. Therefore, he is always creating the earth. Well, they're not going to affirm that, are they? So that entails that the unchangeability of God does not mean that he always is doing the same thing. Right? So that's a problem with their argument there. Uh, a second argument is that, well, the church can't function without ongoing revelations. We need them. Uh, we encounter new circumstances. Well, I suppose uh, if your so-called revelations are deeply entrenched in a historical period and a particular practice, and then the world around you significantly changes that, maybe you think you do need some new revelations. But if your revelations actually come from God and are transcendent, then they transcend time. And the Bible speaks to all men everywhere. Uh, this is a significant difference, I would say, just even in a literary sense between the Bible and the Book of Mormon. Um, literary scholars over and over through the, through the ages, but even today, unbelieving literary scholars will still say, when I read the Bible, I recognize a majesty, I recognize a, a beauty, I recognize a, a power there that I don't see elsewhere. In fact, the Westminster Confession says that these sorts of things are among the evidences that the Bible is the Word of God, uh, the majesty and its, uh, the, the dignity of its style and so on. But then the Confession goes on to say, but the, 
the, uh, the only thing that, that finally persuades us that it is the Word of God is the testimony of the Holy Spirit to our conscience in and by the Scriptures. Okay? Well, you know, if you read the Book of Mormon, uh, it's very difficult to have any sense of anything like that in the reading of the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon was very much embedded in 1820s and 1830s uh, Eastern Midwest, okay? The Midwest we now think of as going all the way to the Mississippi. Well, in those days they didn't think of it that way very much. Midwest was kind of central Pennsylvania, west to you know, early part, the, the eastern part of Indiana. Uh, there was a whole, whole uh, uh, sort of uh, widespread popular interest in various speculative theories as to the origin of Native American Indian culture and uh, how that tied allegedly to ancient Judaism. Uh, these theories were all over the place, and the Book of Mormon stems right straight out of those. Um, and I'll, I'll mention, uh, I'll go ahead and mention it right now. There is very, very strong historical evidence and literary evidence, uh, as well as personal testimony evidence, eyewitness testimony evidence, that, uh, that the Book of Mormon is actually the purloined manuscript of a novel by a man named Solomon Spaulding. Solomon Spaulding had written one novel taking this particular theme about the Native Americans, and it had been fairly popular. It had done pretty well. He wrote a second novel and took it to the print shop in Ohio that had printed his earlier one. And working there at the print shop was a man who fairly soon became a close associate of Joseph Smith, and this was before the Book of Mormon was brought out, okay? And the manuscript for the second novel disappeared from the print shop. And then a few years later, Joseph Smith was preaching in some town, and I've forgotten now the name of the town, but uh, he was quoting from the, Book of Mor from the Book of Mormon. And the man in the audience said, well, old come to pass has come to pass again. By which he was referring to the fact that the Book of Mormon is loaded with the phrase, and it came to pass, and it came to pass, and it came to pass. And by golly, Solomon Spaulding's novels were loaded with that. Well, uh, since then, a number of scholars have examined this. Two of them actually are descendants of two of the three witnesses um, who testified that they had seen Joseph Smith translating the Book of Mormon from the Golden Plates, although interestingly enough, the testimony doesn't say they actually saw the Golden Plates. That was the, those were hidden. Those were only for Joseph to see. Um, and two of those witnesses apostatized later from Mormonism, but two of their descendants were among the scholars who wrote a book by the name of Who Really Wrote the Book of Mormon? And they did enormous research, and they hired literary scholars to compare the style in the Book of Mormon with the style of the known novel by, by uh, Solomon Spaulding. And sure enough, they said, I mean, it is next impossible to imagine that these were not both written by the same author. So there is a very strong probability, historically, that the Book of Mormon was actually stolen from a print shop and it was a novel, and Smith presented it, he passed it off as literal history. There's kind of a, an analogy to that in a later cult that we're not going to be talking about in this course, the cult of Scientology. L. Ron Hubbard was a novelist, a science fiction novelist, and one of his novels became the basis for the, the cultic religion of Scientology. It is amazing to me how easily many people will confuse fiction with fact. Or take another analogy to that. Dan Brown's book, uh, oh, title, Dan Brown. The Da Vinci Code. The Da Vinci Code, right, thank you. Uh, one of those momentary slips there. Uh, 
It's a novel, right? And yet people read that and they think, aha, there's the truth about early Christianity. How sad that our educational system has failed to help people to make the distinction between fiction and history. Um, <clears throat> anyway, let's see. Uh, canon of scripture is not closed. The church can't function without ongoing revelation. Uh, if your revelation is deeply entrenched, uh, really limited by a historical period, maybe you need ongoing revelation. Um, and then finally, uh, Mormons will, will appeal to certain Bible passages to justify their claim, and we're going to look at some of those uh, shortly. Well, let's see if we can uh, provide a refutation of some of the Mormon arguments for their sources of authority. First of all, even if the canon is open, that doesn't entail that Mormon scriptures are canonical. You know? I speak a lot of places, but that doesn't mean that every speech ever given anywhere is for me, right? Well, if God is still speaking, does that entail that he spoke in the Book of Mormon? No. Um, <clears throat> Smith's own version of the Bible didn't add any new books to it. Had he thought that his other things were canonical, he, he could have added them to the Bible at the time, but he didn't do that. Apparently, at least early in his thinking about this, the notion of canonicity and inspiration from God didn't line up very well in his own thinking. The role of, the, of, of prophet was consummated in Christ and ceased after the apostles. Ephesians 2.20 says that the church was, quote, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone or the, the cornerstone. You don't rebuild a, a foundation when you are working on the 110th floor, right? The foundation is there and it stays, right? Everything else is built on that. Um, Hebrews 1 implies that uh, at the time that Hebrews was written, we were coming to the end of the period of prophetic revelation. Uh, Hebrews says, long ago, this is the very beginning of the epistle of the Hebrews, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. And most biblical scholars, as they talk about how Christ's teaching about the, uh, about the apostles uh, relates to the New Testament canon, will argue that that implies that with Christ and his immediate apostles, prophetic revelation ceased. That doesn't mean that people don't still get guidance from the Holy Spirit for their lives in response to prayer. What it does mean is that nobody can stand up and say, thus saith the Lord, and that binds you and me and everybody else. Okay. Um, let's look at a few of the Bible texts that Mormons will appeal to, to, uh, to justify their claims. First of all, Psalm 102.27 and Malachi 3.6 both say that God doesn't change. Well, but that doesn't entail that he always provides prophets to his people. There were, after all, no prophets during the 400-year period uh, immediately preceding John the Baptist. If God doesn't always change and therefore he always has to have prophets, why were there no prophets then? Right? Um, and then second, there are frankly just simply a lot of contradictions between Mormon scriptures and the Bible. And that indicates that they didn't both come from the same God. Right? Um, God doesn't contradict himself. He does not lie. Uh, his truth is never contradicted. Um, they will also appeal to Joel, 28, uh, Joel 2, 28, which predicts a future outpouring of the Holy Spirit in prophecy. And, and uh, in fact, uh, the gift of tongues is common in the Mormon church. And they will say, this is what Joel was talking about in Joel chapter 2. The trouble is that in Acts 2, 16 through 18, Peter refers to what was happening at Pentecost at that time, and he says in reference to Joel 2, this that you're observing now is that. This is that. It fulfilled 
what Joel had prophesied. And that was to be the sign of the, uh, of the fact that the Messiah had come and had fulfilled his, his redeeming work. Now, that was what happened immediately after the death and resurrection of Jesus among his own apostles. So the notion that Joel 2.28 refers instead to Joseph Smith in the Book of Mormon uh, is rather far-fetched. They'll cite Amos 3.7, which says, the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets, uh, and say, well, see, God doesn't do anything without revealing his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Our presidents are the prophets, so everything that God does, he's gonna reveal to them. The tr trouble is that contextually, that addressed Amos's own time in Israel's history and it did not apply beyond that. It was, that's the context. That's part of why you have to learn to really read scripture in context rather than just lifting verses out of it. Uh, a text without context is merely a, a pretext. And then finally, Ephesians 2.20, which I cited a little bit ago, Christ and the apostles and prophets are the foundation and you don't rebuild a foundation later on. All right, so let's move then to the, uh, the Mormon doctrine of the nature of God, um, or the Mormon doctrine of the nature of the gods, because there are lots of them. First of all, in Mormonism, God the Father is an exalted man. Joseph Smith said in Doctrine and Covenants, which is one of those standard works, uh, Doctrine and Covenants, he says, the Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's. And Brigham Young, second president of the Mormon Church, said, and this is recorded in the Journal of Discourses, after men have got their exaltations and their crowns, have become gods, even the sons of God, are made kings and lords of lords, they have the power then of propagating their species in spirit. So you see, what happens is that the gods have spirit children, and then they need to have physical bodies for those spirit children to inhabit. This is actually, by the way, fairly similar to, uh, to the ideas of, of uh, Philo of Alexandria, who was a very curious early Christian theologian. Um, he did some of the most brilliant biblical exegesis, but he also did some highly speculative theology, and Philo taught the doctrine of the pre-existence of souls. I, that term doesn't seem to me to make much sense, but somehow or other it became standard in the history of philosophy and theology. Pre-existence, well, what's pre-existence? Gotta be non-existence, right? But that's not the point. The souls pre-exist the body. I would rather say pre-incarnate souls. Philo taught this, and that helped to, uh, to, to give a basis for some of the Gnostic movement of that period, uh, which in turn led to some very highly speculative use of scripture, some allegorizing uh, uses of scripture. And so you actually have a reflection of that kind of thinking in Joseph Smith's and Brigham Young's thought uh, that is standard for Mormonism. For Mormonism, not only is God the Father an exalted man, but there are many gods. If Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and John the Apostle discovered that God the Father of Jesus Christ had a father, this is Joseph Smith speaking, uh, you may suppose that he had a father also. Where was there ever a son without a father? And where was there ever a father without first being a son? So we are set up now for an infinite regress. Um, in, uh, here is, here is uh, Smith, uh, cited, uh, cited by one of the later presidents, Joseph Fielding Smith. He says, in the very beginning, the Bible shows there is a plurality of gods beyond the power of refutation. That is, you can't argue with this, right? The word Elohim ought to be in the plural all the way through. It should be translated gods, right? Uh, the heads of the gods appointed one God for us, 
and when you take, a view, take view of the subject, it sets one free to see all the beauty, holiness, and perfection of the gods. Now, quickly, let's just address this. The word Elohim is indeed the plural of the word El, right? But in most contexts, in most uses of it, it is coupled with a singular verb. If it were understood as plural, it would be coupled with a plural verb. But it's coupled with singular verbs, it's coupled with singular pronouns, and that indicates that the, the Hebrew writers considered it to be a singular. Well, why then did they use the plural form? Because pluralizing a noun was a standard way, not just in ancient Hebrew, but in all ancient Near, Near Eastern languages, of intensifying it. So if you wanted to, to emphasize, I'm not talking about all these false gods. I'm not talking about, you know, about the gods of the mythologies. I'm not talking about made up gods. I'm talking about God himself, the real God. One way to do that is to pluralize the noun, but then you still will use singular verbs and singular, uh, singular well, yeah, adjectives and pronouns to relate to it. And that tips off your reader familiar with the language of that time. Aha, this is, this is a plural of emphasis rather than a plural of actual plurality, right? Um, uh, furthermore, very often, the Old Testament will speak of Yahweh Elohim. You will see that in your Old Testament as Lord, all caps, Lord God. That's Yahweh Elohim. But Yahweh is just one, right? And so he is Elohim. So Elohim there can't be understood as plural. Or it'll also speak sometimes of Elohim Yahweh, God the Lord, Lord all caps, right? I, by the way, happen to think that it's a real shame that so much of the Christian church followed the pattern of the, uh, the rabbis who stopped actually writing out and speaking the name Yahweh. They did it superstitiously. They were building, uh, you can understand the, the motivation here. The second commandment, uh, the third commandment, I'm, I'm sorry, says you shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain. And so they would think, okay, if we even mispronounce it, we're taking it in vain. I don't think that's the meaning of taking it in vain uh, by any means in the Old Testament, but uh, they wanted to sort of build a fence around the law. And so they said, from now on, we're not going to speak this and we will substitute for Yahweh uh, when we're reading aloud the text and we come to the tetragrammaton, that's, you know, we would transliterate that as Y-H-W-H, -H, uh, which stands for Yahweh. When we read aloud and we come to that, we're, gonna, we're going to have inserted the vowel points for Adonai, the word for Lord, and so as we read along, we'll come to that and we'll simply say Adonai instead. I think it's sad because Yahweh is God's personal name. How many of you would like always to be addressed simply in terms of your title? You know, just called father or mother or husband or wife or CEO or whatever. It depersonalizes things in some very important ways. And we do that, I believe, partly to our relationship with, with God when we just simply use the all caps Lord. About Oh, seven or eight years ago, I, I just became increasingly convinced that this was significant spiritually. And so I began the habit as I would read aloud, whether from the pulpit when I was, uh, when I was ministerial assistant at a church that I planted, or in my family's devotions or whatever, as I read aloud in the Old Testament, I'd come to all caps Lord, and I would just say Yahweh instead of the Lord. And you know what? It really has made a difference in my sense of, of this personal bond, you know. I'm not addressing him just simply as this officer out there. He's Yahweh. It's like saying to my friend, David, you know, hey, David, you know, can you come over for dinner tonight, right? I don't say, hey, CEO, you know. I, I say his personal name. Now, it's not just for that reason, but also this getting away from that, I think, depersonalizes God in terms of a whole lot of the culture that in the 
18th, 19th, early 20th centuries was still saturated with Bible, right? Because most people who, who grew up in Britain and America during that period learned to read out of the Bible. And so they would encounter the Lord over and over again. Joseph Smith was one of those people. And I can't help wondering if he had grown up with Yahweh Elohim instead of the Lord Elohim, if he might have had just a slightly different perception of who God is, and he might not then have been so prone to misunderstand and think that Elohim was plural instead of intensive. Well, interesting problem. Okay, uh, next. Mormonism's trinity is tritheistic and an integral part of its polytheistic doctrine. Joseph Smith said in Documentary History of the Church, many men say there is one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are all only one God. I say that is a strange God anyhow, three in one and one in three. It's a curious organization. All are to be crammed into one God according to sectarianism. It would make the biggest God in all the world. He would be a wonderfully big God. He would be a giant or a monster. Now, to us, we hear that and we think, whoa, that's a really weird way of arguing about this because after all, God is a spirit. He's not, he doesn't have a body. How can we talk about big or little, anything like that? How can you say that if you had two or three of them, you know, pulled together, it'd be big and monstrous? Remember, for them, God has a body just like yours and mine, right? And now they hear Trinitarians saying that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all one God. Well, this God's got these three bodies that are all jammed together. It's gotta be a monster, right? So notice how the different errors tie together and amplify each other in this sort of thinking. Um, let's see. Uh, next quote here is from James Talmadge, who was a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles uh, from 1911 to 1933. In his book, Jesus the Christ, Talmadge wrote, the unity of the, Godness, uh, of the Godhead was a oneness of perfection in purpose, plan, and action, as the scriptures declare it to be, and not an impossible union of personalities as generations of false teachers had, try, have, had tried to impress. Now, notice he uses the word personalities in there. For Mormonism, person and individual human body are inseparable. If you don't have a human body, you're not a person, right? And so that lies behind that thinking. For biblical thought, a person is a center of consciousness with or without a body, which is why angels are persons. It's why Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are persons, but not with bodies. And it's why we can speak of three persons being the same God, because there are three centers of consciousness, right? And actually our whole understanding of person was heavily shaped by the early Trinitarian controversies in the third and fourth centuries. And uh, what it means to be a person is actually derived from our understanding of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you ever want to get into, into that, you can read Paul Witz's book, uh, Psychology, the, the Cult of Self-Worship, in that he actually talks about how the modern concept of personhood is derived from Trinitarian thought, and we didn't really even have a strong concept of personhood before that period in, in church history. Um, personhood before that was basically a legal concept. A uh, person was simply one who could have a legal claim in a court, uh, but it didn't have anything to do with the, uh, what we talked about earlier in terms of cognition, volition, affection, uh, relationships, personal relationships were, were not well understood under that old way of thinking. So uh, for Mormonism, um, the, uh, the Trinity is actually three separate gods rather than uh, one God who is three persons. Now, some of you will probably also have heard of what is called the Adam-God doctrine, the Adam-God doctrine. 
And this is highly controversial in Mormon circles and in Mormon cult apologetics circles. Uh, some cult apologists will say, don't even bring that up because the Mormon church doesn't teach that anymore. And it just becomes uh, an opportunity for them to say, oh, you don't even know what you're talking about. You don't know what Mormon teaching really is. Uh, I'm, you know, I have a little bit of sympathy for that, but I do think that it is appropriate for us to point out what, in fact, Brigham Young, second president of the Mormon Church, the prophet, taught vehemently uh, as the very word of God and insisted that you had to believe this in order to be saved. Um, Young said, among many other things, um, when, our, <coughs> excuse me, when our father Adam came into the Garden of Eden, he came into it with a celestial body and brought Eve. A celestial body is a body that was resurrected and went to the highest heavens. So there are three heavens in Mormon uh, cosmology, and the highest one is the celestial. And the body there is fully glorified and ready to be a god and create its own planet and people it, all right, through, its, through his multiple spirit wives. And Eve is one of those, right? So when our father Adam came into the Garden of Eden, he came into it with a celestial body and brought Eve, one of his wives, with him. He helped to make and organize this world. He is Michael, the archangel. There's an interesting twist. God is Michael, the archangel. Um, that's the same Michael the archangel, of course, who, who, when he was confronting Satan, didn't say, you know, didn't rebuke him himself, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So uh, Michael apparently recognized that God the Father was more authoritative than he was. Um, but these men didn't seem to know the scriptures very well. He is Michael the archangel, the ancient of days, about whom holy men have written and spoken. He is our Father and our God, and the only God with whom we have to do. Notice that. Mormons will deny that they're polytheists because they only worship one God. Now, there are lots and lots of gods who have created worlds all over the place with their many goddesses, okay? But Adam is the only God with whom they have to do because he created this world. So if you only worship one of the gods, you're not a polytheist. Tell that to a Hindu. There are 613 million, I think, Hindu gods and goddesses and you get to pick which ones of them you want to worship. Um, Young went on, every man upon the earth, professing Christians or non-professing, must hear it and will know it sooner or later. When the Virgin Mary conceived the child Jesus, the Father had begotten him in his own likeness. Now understand this, God the Father has a celestial body and he conceived Jesus in the Virgin Mary. What happens to the virgin birth? She was a virgin at the start. She was not a virgin by the time the conception took place, was she? Right? Because this was a bodily intercourse between Adam, our father and our God, and the only God with whom we have to do, and Mary. So he took on this earthly wife too. Mary gets to be one of his wives. Uh, he was not begotten by the Holy Ghost. And who is the father? He is the first of the human family. It's all a direct quote from Brigham Young in a sermon on April 9, 1852, that was transcribed by a specialist in shorthand. Those were very common in, in society in those days. And Brigham Young checked over the transcription and approved it before it was published. Now, Young's doctrine, doctrine was uh, fairly controversial in the 19th century. Uh, most Mormons, just simply because he was the prophet and the president of the Mormon church, they, they accepted it. But some had a real tough time with that. And um, by the, by the uh, late 20th century, mid to late 20th century, it was increasingly out of favor. And now the Mormon church says that it simply rejects that doctrine. So there was an instance of... of you know, uh, Young's having taught something as the prophet of God, the president of the Mormon church, and eventually it gets abandoned, as did polygamy. Um, but polygamy was abandoned because of a, a specific new revelation through another president of the Mormon church. 
there hasn't been, so far as I know, the claim that in a specific new revelation, this old revelation from Brigham Young was set aside, was superseded. So, you know, what I think is that uh, it's legitimate for us to bring this up and say, okay, so you don't believe in this? But Brigham Young clearly did. And you consider him to have been a prophet of God, the president of the Mormon church. Why do you trust him on anything else? You see, and by doing that, we, we undermine their faith in one of what they consider to be their sources of religious truth. Okay, so let's look then at refuting the Mormon doctrine of God. And here, you know, we, we have to just simply go back to scripture, to the Bible. And the Mormons will say, but we have later revelation that supersedes that. And our response really needs to be twofold. One, God doesn't contradict himself. If he, if he said something at one time, he's not gonna say that is not true, all right? Two, you and I have to be confident in the power of the scripture to pierce into the hearts of men. Hebrews 4.12 says, the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and of spirit and of joints and of marrow. And I've forgotten exactly how verse 13 reads, but it, it is that it convicts the conscience and brings about repentance. So we have to have the confidence that as we apply the real word of God to these people, God's word will not go forth and come back to him empty. It will achieve everything that he proposes for it to do. So, some passages that simply you cannot reconcile with their teaching. First of all, the notion that God the Father is an exalted man uh, and has a body just like men's. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. There is no end to that. There is no beginning to that. So he didn't used to be a man. He's not an exalted man. Numbers 23, 19 specifically says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. And by the way, if God doesn't repent, how is it that he said one thing through Moses or the Apostle Paul or, I, or Isaiah, and then he, he overturns that through Joseph Smith or Brigham Young? God is not a man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should repent. John 4.24 says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And Jesus in Luke 24, in the passage about the disciples on the road to Emmaus, uh, they think that he's a ghost. A pneuma, a spirit, right? Greek word, pneuma. They think that he's a pneuma. And he says, handle me and see. A pneuma does not have flesh and bones as you see me have. Okay? So a spirit doesn't have a body. God is a spirit. Um, man's being created in the image of God doesn't imply that God has a body, for the image of God is invisible. Colossians 1.15 says that Christ is, quote, the image of the invisible God. The image of God is not arms and legs and head and chest and shoulders and all of that. The image of God is intellect, cognition, remember, Colossians 3.10, put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Will, volition, Ephesians 4.24, put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Affection, 2 Peter 1.5 through 7, which tells us toward the end that we're supposed to have godliness, godliness with brotherly affection and, and brotherly, brotherly affection with love. And then dominion. Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over everything that moves on the face of the earth. So these are the image of God. These are the things that constitute the image of God in us, not the having of a body of this or that size or shape or anything like that. Um, next, there is only one true God. Um, 
Deuteronomy 4.35 says, Yahweh is God. There is no other besides him. And in Isaiah 44, 6 through 8, Yahweh says, thus, thus says Yahweh, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, Yahweh of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare it and set it before him, before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. That is, if, if you want to declare yourself a God, sure, tell the future. See how that goes. Can you do that? I do that, right? Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. That's God's testimony about himself. This is the God that they say is the God of Mormonism. He just totally denies polytheism. In 1 Timothy 2.5, if we want to go to the New Testament, Paul writes, there is one God, and there's one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. You know, even philosophically, we can challenge this. Remember our definition of God, that God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his wisdom, power, justice, holiness, goodness, and truth? Right? It is logically impossible to have more than one infinite thing of the same nature. Because in order for there to be two, one of them has to limit the other. There is, you know, there's a limit, there's a boundary. One is not the other. You can't do that with an infinite, right? But scripture very clearly teaches that God is infinite, that there is no limit to his, to his being, to the spirit that God is, right? Now there are other spirits, but they're not spirits of the same nature as God. They are not infinite, they're not eternal, they're not unchangeable, right? They are finite, they are temporal, they are changeable. They are mortal spirits by nature. They are given immortality only by new birth in Christ. Um, let's see. The biblical doctrine of the Trinity teaches that there is but one true God, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are each God, and that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are distinct persons. Uh, first of all, we've just gone over the fact that there's only one true God. Second, that the Father is God. Well, John 17, 3, Jesus speaks to the Father and he says, you are the only true God. So the Father's God. John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. That's the Son, that's Jesus. So Jesus is God. And many other places in Scripture teach that. Second, uh, Titus 2.13 says that we are awaiting the, glory, the, 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 uh, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 2 refers to our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, Christ is called God in a number of different places. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. In, uh, I didn't put this in the outline, but um, 2 Corinthians 3.17 says uh, that, actually most of our English translations put it, the Lord is the Spirit, or the Lord is that Spirit, but I think that the Greek grammar there, uh, through technicalities that I won't explain right now, I think the Greek grammar uh, instead suggests that it should be translated in the opposite order, uh, and, and it says, the Spirit is the Lord. And contextually, Paul has been citing a passage in the Old Testament where the Lord refers to Yahweh. And so it's saying in 2 Corinthians 3.17, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is Yahweh. So we have that. Uh, some people will say, oh, but you know, isn't the Holy Spirit just a, an impersonal force? Yeah, when does an impersonal force say, in Acts 13, 2, separate to me, that's a personal pronoun, Barnabas and Saul to the work to which I, another personal pronoun, have called them, right? So, uh, and a, a few cults will say, well, the Holy Spirit 
didn't even come into existence until after Jesus came because after all, John, what is it, John 14, 37, the Holy Spirit was not yet, uh, is, is uh, how the old AV translated Jesus' words there. Well, the problem is that contextually, uh, Jesus was talking about the giving of the Holy Spirit in fulfillment of Joel 2, and so it should be interpolated, it should be provided in the translation there, was not yet given, okay? Not that he didn't yet exist. And in fact, Hebrews 9.14 says, Christ offered himself through the eternal spirit. So the Holy Spirit is eternal, he's personal, and he is indeed called God. Uh, so the, the Spirit is God. So, and then lastly, they are distinct persons. The Father loves the Son. He sends the Son. The Son uh, prays to the Father. He says that he was sent from the Father. The Father and the Son both send the Holy Spirit and so on. So you see personal interrelationships among them. Uh, Jesus says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. If they were the same thing, you couldn't say that. I mean, that would be like my saying, I am in me and me is in I. Right? That wouldn't make any sense whatsoever. The whole purpose of prepositions in language is to express relationship, not identity, right? And so when you use in there, uh, or in John 1.1, 1, 1, the the, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, there's a relationship expressed by that preposition with there. So in Matthew 28, 19, uh, in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, what you have is a, a Greek grammatical construction that uses what we call the definite article. We see it usually in our English translations as the, before every one of the three persons named, or the, the three personal nouns used. And when that happens, uh, according to a particular Greek principle, Grammarians refer to as Granville Sharp's rule because it was discovered by a, an English grammarian uh, who was also a Greek grammarian in the early 19th century by the name of Granville Sharp. Uh, according to that rule, this shows that the author intended the reader to understand that Father, Son, and Spirit were distinct persons from each other. So you have the three all wrapped up there together. Uh, they are one God, but they're distinct persons. So as, as we've said before, uh, if the doctrine of the Trinity is that there is but one God, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is each a distinct, is, is each God, and that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is each a distinct person, we do have that taught in the scriptures. Well, next we're gonna look at the Mormon doctrine of man. And we're, this, this begins to get a little more complicated, unfortunately. Um, uh, first, let's go to a sort of a summary of this. Um, human beings pre-existed as organized intelligences. Uh, the presidency member John Taylor in the Journal of Discourses said, we look at humankind as emanating from the gods, as a god in embryo, as an eternal being who had an existence before he came here. That, by the way, suggests that the notion of eternal in Mormon thought differs from the notion of eternal in biblical and standard Western philosophical thought. Eternal seems to be, uh, to be limited to the particular world you're talking about, okay? Whereas we think of eternal as there was never an, a beginning and there will never be an end, okay? Uh, for, Mormon, uh, for, for Mormon thought, notice this, we look at man, uh, at humankind as emanating from the gods, as a god in embryo, as an eternal being who had an existence before he came here. Well, how can that be if indeed all of these spirit children are the product of, of procreation between the god of this planet and his various goddess wives? Well, it's because for them, eternity is just, it's, it's planet indexed, right? It's planet limited, right? Um, these intelligences were born of heavenly parents and are gods in an embryonic state. Brigham Young said in the Journal of Discourses, the intelligence we possess is from our Father and our God. Every attribute that is in his character is in his children in embryo. So we 
exist before our incarnation as intelligences procreated by our God, the God of our planet, and one of his various celestial wives, and uh, then we get to grow into Godhood. Part of their progression to Godhood includes a probationary period on Earth. And there was a, a great war in heaven that divided the children of God into two camps. One third followed Lucifer and two thirds followed Jesus in battle. Um, Joseph Fielding Smith says, in this great rebellion in heaven, Lucifer or Satan, a son of the morning, and one third of the hosts thereof were cast out into the earth because Lucifer sought to destroy the free agency of man and one third of the spirits sided with him. Uh, he sought to destroy the free agency of man? Here's the explanation. He sought the throne of God and put forth his plan in boldness in that great council, declaring that he would save all, that not one soul should be lost, provided God would give him the glory and the honor. When his plan was rejected for a better one, he rebelled. So to save all for, for Joseph Fielding Smith would have entailed that man's free agency was destroyed. Right? Now, that's a, an interesting question in terms of Christian theology, but that's where it stems from there. There were no neutrals in the war, of heaven, uh, war in heaven, said uh, uh, Joseph Fielding Smith. All took sides either with Christ or with Satan. Now, so you've got a third following Satan with his plan to save everybody. That plan gets rejected by the council of the gods. Notice there's a council of the gods that determines what's going to happen on earth. Um, and then there are two thirds who follow Jesus. Now, of those two thirds, one half were less valiant than the others. I'm sorry, one third of those two thirds were less valiant than the others. And so they received black skin when they came to earth, uh, and that explains the origin of the Negro race. And so Joseph Fielding Smith said in The Way to Perfection, we naturally conclude that others among the two thirds did not show the loyalty to their redeemer that they should. That the Negro race, for instance, have been placed under restrictions because of their attitude in the world of spirits, few will doubt. And uh, Joseph Smith in Doctrines of Salvation said, every man had his agency there and men receive rewards here based upon their actions there, meaning in the heavens before they were incarnate, they had their agency, they made their choices. And here uh, they get rewards based on those actions, just as they will receive rewards hereafter for deeds done in the body. How we're born here reflects how we behaved before we were born into our bodies, and how we're going to be born into the next stage reflects how we behave here. The Negro, evidently, is receiving the reward of his merits. Okay? It's fascinating how much this ties, frankly, into the, the Eastern Hindu concept of reincarnation and karma. Okay, you build up merits or demerits, and those are reflected in what you were born into in your next life cycle, right? Now, so there's this war in heaven. God comes to earth to start things going here. And this is part of why it's so difficult to, to sustain the Mormon theological system without the Adam God doctrine, okay? Um, Mormons don't want to embrace Adam God, but the problem is that they still speak in terms of God having come into the earth, God having been in the garden, and we're all his children, right? Now, um, Joseph Fielding Smith in Doctrines of Salvation said, 
that Adam didn't transgress. Uh, pardon me, Adam did transgress, but he did not sin. He fell upward, okay? Quote, I never speak of the part Eve took in this fall as a sin, nor do I accuse Adam of a sin. It is true, the Lord warned Adam and Eve that to partake of the fruit they would transgress a law, and this happened. But it is not always a sin to transgress a law. That is, his transgression was in accordance with law. Interesting because it fit the plan for the whole thing. There had to be a fall in order for the bodies to become mortal so that there could be bodily procreation. And then there would be bodies for the pre-incarnate spirits to inhabit so that they could go through their probations so that they could get to become gods and go off and create their own planets and repeat the whole thing, right? Adam fell said Sir Sterling Sill, an assistant to the, to the apostles in Deseret News in 1965. Adam fell, but he fell in the right direction. He fell toward the goal. Adam fell, but he fell upward. Right? Now, Adam's transgression is not passed on to the human race. Each person is responsible only for his or her own sins. So the doctrine of original sin disappears here. Quote, we believe that all men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgression. That is from the Pearl of Great Price, the Articles of Faith, uh, Article 2. Uh, so that's key to Mormon theology. The ultimate goal of humanity is to become a perfected God. So that uh, Heber Kimball, one of the presidents of the Mormon church, one of the later prophets, said, when you have learned to become obedient to the Father that dwells upon this earth, to the Father and God of this earth, and obedient to the messengers he sends, when you have done all that, remember, you are not going to leave this earth. You will never leave it until you become qualified and capable and capacitated to become a father of an earth yourselves. And Joseph Fielding Smith says, the Father has promised us that through our faithfulness, we shall be blessed with the fullness of his kingdom. In other words, we will have the privilege of becoming like him. Doesn't that sound familiar, you know, from Genesis 3, right? To become like him, we must have all the powers of Godhood. Thus, a man and his wife, when glorified, will have spirit children, who eventually will go on an earth like this one we are on and pass through the same kind of experiences, being subject to mortal conditions, and if faithful, then they also will receive the fullness of exaltation and partake of the same blessings. There is no end to this development. It will go on forever. There's no final judgment in Mormonism. It's just this constant uh, infinite chain, infinite regress, or infinite progress, all right? So men may become gods, said Joseph Smith in his History of the Church. Quote, God himself was once as we are now, and is an exalted man, and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. That is the great secret. If the veil were rent today, and the great God who holds this world in its orbit and who upholds all worlds and all things by his power was to make himself visible, I say, if you were to see him today, you would see him like a man in form, like yourselves in all the person, image, and very form as a man. It is the first principle of the gospel to know for a certainty the character of God and to know that we may converse with him as one man converses with another and that he was once a man like us, yea, that God himself, the Father of us all, dwelt on an earth the same as Jesus Christ himself did. So this, is, this is truly key. This is not a side issue for Mormonism. Now, how about some biblical refutation of that? First of all, humans didn't pre-exist as intelligences. They didn't pre-exist at all. Uh, in Mormonism, you're a spirit first, then you come into a body. 1 Corinthians 15, 46 through 49 says this, It is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. And then God breathed into him the breath of life, and became, he became a living soul, right? The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. 
As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. For Jesus, there was spiritual existence before there was incarnation. But he's different from us in that respect. And when we become born again, when we are regenerated, we become spiritually alive as he is. Before that, we too are just dust, which is why the Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians 2 that we were dead in trespasses and sins, and God made us alive. Um, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. So in biblical thought, you, don't, you aren't existent as a spirit before you're incarnate. The two come at the same moment in terms of your natural procreation. And then, but because you were born spiritually dead, you need to be made spiritually alive through a new birth. Um, while man's life on earth may be described as probationary, it is not probation to determine worthiness to become gods and goddesses, but to determine worthiness to, uh, to be reconciled with God, to have fellowship with him, and to spend eternity in that fellowship with him. That is, to enter into heaven. And all fail. Okay. Yeah, are we on probation here? You betcha. And we all fail. Right? With those who do enter heaven, doing so only because they are redeemed by Christ, not because they have passed the probationary tests. Romans 3.23 says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Philippians 3.8-14 says, For Christ's sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in, in, in his death, that by any means possible I may attain to becoming a God and having my own planet and my wives and all that. No, no, no. What is Paul's goal? That I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul doesn't think he's gonna become a God. He's gonna be resurrected into blessed fellowship with God. That's our goal. Um, now, granted no human pre-existence, the whole war in heaven idea in Mormonism collapses. But particularly reprehensible is its racist explanation of the origin of the Negro race. For Acts 10, 34, and 35 says that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, every ethne, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. There's no difference between white and black and brown and yellow and red. We're all just human beings, right? In Acts 17, 26, Paul says that God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. That's the unity of the human race. There are not separate human races. There's only one human race. Um, Adam did not fall upward. His transgression of the law was sin, and it brought death to him and all his posterity. 1 John 3, 4 says, uh, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. If Adam transgressed, it was sin. Every transgression of the law is sin. Genesis 2, 16 through 17, Yahweh God commanded the man, Adam, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. But Remember, Romans 3.23 said the wages of sin, Romans 6.23 said the wages of sin is death. So that means that Adam's eating of the tree had to be not just transgression, but sin. 
Uh, Genesis 3.21, Yahweh God made for Adam and for his wife. Gar, uh, I'm sorry, I skipped a passage here. Uh, Genesis 3, 17 through 19, we have the story of Adam and Eve taking from the tree and uh, uh, then God pronouncing the judgment on them and his saying to Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life, etc. Um, you are dust, to dust you will return. This is punishment, and punishment comes on sin. Uh, in Genesis 3.21, Yahweh God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Why? They needed kofer, they needed atonement, covering from skins that came from death and the shedding of blood. Right? So right there, God provided sacrificial animals to picture the eventual sacrifice of his son. And in Romans 5, 12 through 19, we read, Just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Sin came into the world through one man. That's Adam, right? It was his sin. So we cannot say with the Mormons that he, he transgressed, but he didn't sin. And we can't say that he fell upward. Now, Adam's transgression, contrary to Mormonism, is passed on to the whole human race. Romans 5, 12 through 19 is all about that very, the, that very matter, the passing on of Adam's sin. And in fact, when, well, I will, I'll go ahead and cite that whole passage. Um, Paul says, Just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned because all sinned. Now, the, the Greek grammar there tells us that the sinning was all done at one moment by the same man, Adam, and his sinning meant all of us sinned. Exactly how that is to be explained, there are different theories about exactly that deal, but grammatically it's very clear. When Adam sinned, we sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Well, you know, how do we know that sin was in the law before the, uh, in the world before the law was given? Because there was death before the law was given, right? Well, how could that be? I mean, Moses came along and he gave the law. How could there be death before it? Because God had implanted a law in Adam. We know that he must have had the law because there was, there was death. If there were no law, there'd be no sin because sin is the transgression of the law. So there had to be law, and that had to be in Adam. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Adam is a type of Christ. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of the one, that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. Condemnation is deserved because of the trespass. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. If because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Adam represented us in sin. Christ represents us in righteousness. Therefore, as one trespass by Adam led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and, and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. So you notice how original sin and the imputation of Adam's sin to his posterity and Christ's original righteousness and its imputation to his posterity are parallel to each other. Uh, if you get rid of imputed sin, you also get rid of imputed righteousness. And this is why Mormonism cannot understand the biblical doctrine of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. It doesn't have imputation of Adam's sin to us, therefore it can't have imputation of Christ's righteousness to us. So all the theology works together, right? 
Now, Adam's transgression is passed on to the whole human race, which we've just seen. And the ultimate goal of humanity is not to become gods, let alone gods and goddesses who will have spirit children, but to become perfectly holy as God is, yet still human, not divine. Uh, the divine nature doesn't permit of a plurality of gods. Um, you know, Paul tells the Galatians in Galatians 4 that they once followed those who were not gods by nature. We call all sorts of things gods, but, but there's only one God by nature, and that is the one who is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, and wisdom, power, justice, holiness, goodness, and truth. There's only one God like that, and there cannot be more than one. Logically, it cannot have more than one infinite of the same nature, right? Um, Isaiah 43.10 says, You are my witnesses, says the Lord. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. You cannot reconcile that with Mormon theology. Matthew 22, 29 through 30 says, Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, you are wrong, I cited this in our introductory unit, remember, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Now what was it that they were wrong about? Well, the Sadducees had tried to trip him up about this man who had, or this, this woman who had seven husbands and they all died leaving her childless. All right, whose, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? Jesus says, you're wrong because you don't know the scriptures, you don't know the power of God. If you'd known the scriptures, you would have known this. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Not our angels, but are like angels in that they neither marry nor are given in marriage. How can, how can the Mormon theology accommodate that? It, it cannot. It's a clear contradiction. Well, now we come to the Mormon doctrine of salvation. Um, first of all, Christ's atonement secures resurrection for all men, some to the glory of progressing to godhood, some not. But it secures glory for none, okay? It secures the resurrection, which gives you the potential to become a god, but it doesn't secure your becoming a god. You have to secure that through your own efforts. Uh, Joseph Fielding Smith said in Doctrines of Salvation, every soul born upon the face of this earth shall come forth in the resurrection, either of the just or of the unjust, for the resurrection shall be universal, and that too through the great atonement which was made by the Savior of the world. Now. For biblical theology, resurrection was certain for everybody. It wasn't resurrection that Christ bought for us. It was justification, reconciliation with God. We would all have been resurrected to an eternity in suffering had it not been for the, resur for, for the, the atoning death and the resurrection of Christ. Um, glory is conditioned on personal works of righteousness. Bruce McConkie in A New Witness for the Articles of Faith, one of the Mormon leaders says, because there was such an atonement, man can have faith, perform the works of righteousness, endure to the end, and work out his own salvation with fear and trembling, thus misusing Philippians 2.12, uh, which says not that we work for, but that we work during our salvation. Uh, that's the actual meaning of that there, to work out. Uh, it's to, we work during the time of our salvation, not for it, but because of it. Um, for Mormonism, Christ's atonement was only for Adam's transgression. Um, Jesus Christ redeemed all from the fall. He paid the price. He offered himself as a ransom. He atoned for Adam's sin, leaving us responsible only for our own sins, said the Apostle Legrand Richards in A Marvelous Work and a Wonder. Uh, Articles of Faith, Article 2, we believe that men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgression. Christ's atonement, this is an interesting little wrinkle, Christ's atonement was accomplished in the Garden of Gethsemane, not on the cross. McConkie says in his book, The Mortal Messiah, and then there is Gethsemane, the Garden of the Olive Press, where he sweat great drops of blood from every pore. So great was his suffering and so intense his anguish as he took upon himself the sins of all men on conditions of repentance. So in Gethsemane was where Christ paid the penalty for us. Individual salvation requires works in addition to Christ's atonement. 
Articles of Faith, Article 4, we believe that the first principles and ordinances of the gospel are, first, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, second, repentance, third, baptism by immersion for the remission of sins, fourth, laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. So faith in Christ, <coughs> excuse me, faith in Christ is insufficient. One must also have faith in Joseph Smith, as well as good works. Brigham Young said, the time was when the test of a Christian was his confession of Christ. This is no test to this generation, for all men of the Christian world confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This generation, however, is not left without a test. I have taught for 30 years and still teach that he that believeth in his heart and confesseth with his mouth that Jesus is the Christ and that Joseph Smith is his prophet to this generation is of God. And he that confesseth not that Jesus has come in the flesh and sent Joseph Smith with the fullness of the gospel to this generation is not of God, but is Antichrist. And uh, Young again says, there is not a man or woman who violates the covenants made with their God that will not be required to pay the debt. The blood of Christ will never wipe that out. Your own blood must atone for it. And that was the root of a doctrine called the, the doctrine of blood atonement. And the Mormons would actually sometimes execute people in Utah, in the Utah ter territories for breaking Mormon law, but not uh, civil, you know, criminal law saying this is how we are helping you to shed your blood to atone for your sins so that you can qualify to move on and, you know, toward godhood. Um, and finally, Mormons can save the dead by proxy baptism. Remember the Article 4 of the Articles of Faith said that we believe that we were saved partly by baptism for the remission of our sins. Well, through baptism, we become saviors on Mount Zion and may save multitudes of our kin, says Joseph Fielding Smith in Doctrines of Salvation. Brigham Young said, millions of our fellow creatures who have lived upon the earth and died without a knowledge of the gospel must be officiated for in order that they may inherit eternal life. So Mormons will be baptized in proxy for ancestors and that way their ancestors can have access to heaven, right? Um, and this, by the way, explains why the Mormon church is so into genealogies. Because through genealogical research, you discover who your ancestors were so that you can lovingly get yourself baptized for them. You go to one of the temples and you do it and you get baptized again and again and again and again and again on behalf of various different ancestors and that sets them free. Oh, my. What about their need for repentance and faith? You know, you just do this baptism. It really reminds me in many ways of the, the whole Catholic indulgence thing back at the time of the Reformation. You know? um, well, let's take a look at uh, refuting this kind of teaching. Um, first of all, Christ's atoning death actually secures perfection and consequently final salvation for all for whom he died. This is a powerful, powerful message. This so distinguishes the Christian gospel from every sub-Christian thing. All the others, whatever, whatever it was that Christ did, it wasn't sufficient. The Christian gospel says Christ's death is sufficient completely. Listen to this from Hebrews 10, verses 4 through 22. It's an extended passage, but hear it. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. Notice the difference there. None of the, none of the lambs, none of the bulls, none of the goats, anything like that could do God's will because they didn't have moral volition. They lacked the image of God. 
They could never fulfill the will of God as substitutes for others for whom they were sacrificed. They could only picture what would be done by Christ. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. What he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He abolishes the first, the old sacrificial system, in order to, uh, to um, establish the second. And by that will, I have come to do your will. By that will, we have been sanctified, set aside. Notice that this is a particular use of the verb sanctify. Sometimes we talk about sanctification as this progressive thing that happens through our lives from conversion to death. Now, this is our setting apart uh, you know, instantaneously in the plan of God, right? Um, by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifices for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, Chapter 1 of Hebrews had referred to Christ seated, being seated at the right hand of God as well. This sitting down was symbolic of his having finished his task. The work was over. He's now at rest, as was God on the seventh day after six days of creating the earth. He's now at rest. The work is finished. He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering... He has, get this language, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. There wasn't by the offering of bulls and goats and heifers and sheep forgiveness of sins. That's why they had to be done over and over and over again. But Christ's death truly brought forgiveness, which is why it would never be repeated. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, curtain in the temple, dividing the main temple area from the Holy of Holies. Only the priest could go in there once a year and then only with a blood sacrifice. Jesus tore that curtain down. He gave all of his people access into the Holy of Holies, symbolic of absolute reconciliation with God. And because of this, we can have this boldness, this confidence to enter in there. Since we have a great high priest, a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a, full, with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This is the perfect work of Christ. This is the fully sufficient work of Christ. We could refer again to Romans 5, uh, 15 through 19, but I'm going to skip over that one and just go to Romans 3, 23 through 28. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation uh, by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. So somebody might have objected, hey, you didn't punish these people. You must not be just. No, no, no. God says, I passed over them for the time being. Here's why. I punished them in Christ. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? How does that exclude boasting? 
No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Christ's atonement was not only for Adam's transgression, but also for the sins of every believer. 1 John 2, 1 through 2 says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. Not just for Adam's, for our sins. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 21. You were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sake, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. For your sake, for your sake, not just for Adam's sake, 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. And Christ's atonement was accomplished on the cross, not in the Garden of Gethsemane. There are many passages we could look at. I'll just quote one here, Matthew 26, 36 through 39. Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane and going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. What was he referring to? He was referring to the cup of the cross, not to his time in the garden. First Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. He bore our sins in his body on the tree, the cross. Um, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, not by any works of righteousness that we do. Romans 3.20, by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Romans 3.23 through 28, I cited for you just a moment ago. Romans 4.1 through 8, well, what then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, not works, and more. No one can save another by proxy baptism or by any other means. None of us can do that. Psalm 49 verses seven through, 10, uh, seven through nine say this, truly no man, can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of his life is costly and can never suffice that he should live on forever and never see the pit. This is precisely why the priests of the Old Testament system had to offer sacrifices over and over and over again. They could never take away sin. Neither can any Mormon being baptized for some ancestor we cannot save others, only Christ. Isaiah 43, 11 says, I am Yahweh and besides me there is no savior. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And in Acts 4, 11 through 12, Peter says, this, is, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So those, you've got the basic structure of Mormon theology there and its false gospel. You've got the Christian gospel clearly contrasted with it. And you know, when we witness to Mormons or anybody else, our, our focus has to be on Let's get them to the gospel. Let's get them to the work of Christ. Let's bring them to the cross of Christ. That's where everything uh, gets wrapped up. We have hope to offer. There is no hope in Mormonism. Remember my reference to my friend Jerry, who after he heard me read you know, all of that from Romans 3 and plugged his name into it, you know, he finally came back and said, I realized I had no hope. I could never live up to that. I, I was without hope, without Christ. 
Well, we need to present Christ and his finished, sufficient work on the Christ uh, on the cross. And it is amazing how God uses that to attract people to him. So, I'd be glad to entertain some questions if you have any at this point. Would you say that Joseph Smith was nothing but a, a pitiful man who was duped by some kind of appearance of an angel, or was he a scoundrel of a man who I, took advantage of an opportunity? To I think he was a total charlatan. I really do. Just a complete charlatan who managed to take advantage of a whole bunch of very gullible people. Uh, the, the time was well set for it. I have no doubt that, you know, that there are spiritual forces of wickedness behind this, right? But in terms of Smith, I, I, everything about his past before he got into this stuff and everybody, everything about his life after it says he was just a shyster. What would the Mormons say when asked about hell? The unjust are raised uh, you know, in resurrection. They don't get to go into heaven. They don't get to go into one of the three levels of, of heaven, the celestial, the telestial, or the terrestrial. Instead, they do go to a place of torment. So yeah, there's something kind of similar to hell for them. But. Just a follow-up question: Unless their descendants baptize, them. right? Yeah, I suppose then you get plucked out. Though Jesus said, of course, that you know there's no way to go from there to here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there are all sorts of inconsistency in the thought. If God had created the world and God was also Adam, which you're saying they no longer really claim that, but if that were the case, how would God be talking to himself in the Garden of Eden? Like, if there's God there and there's Adam there, would that oh, be another uh, God? Or You got me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you know, uh, that would have been a real interesting question to ask Brigham Young. You know? yeah. Okay, well, who was it who walked with there's him the in the cool yeah. of the day in the garden and, and said these things to him? Who, who was that? Yeah. I, I don't know an answer to that. Okay. If one of these, um, the Mormon missionaries, do mm -hmm. show up at our door, what would be the first thing we should say to them? I've had them come to my home various different times, and I've handled it different ways. I usually, I want to hear what they say first. But this is what I will always do, is I'll say, yes, I will listen to your presentation on condition that you promise me that you will give me just as much time to make my own presentation to you afterward. Not asking anything unreasonable here. I just want fair, you know, balanced here. Uh, so, so I'll do that with them. And then I try, as I listen carefully to how they do their presentation, I'm looking for some entree there. I'm looking for something that will, uh, and you, you have to pray, you, ask the, you have to ask the Lord for wisdom to see, okay, what's the vulnerable point in this guy? And sometimes, um, you know, not just with Mormons, but with all sorts of different cultists, when they are, there are two or three of them together, it will be very clear that you know, one guy is very much in charge and the others are younger and they're kind of being discipled. I will focus on those younger ones. And you know, I'm concerned about reaching them. I'm not nearly so concerned about reaching the, the pro, right? Um, so I'll ask them questions that will uh, reveal cracks, reveal inconsistencies in their faith, because I figure they are the they are the much more likely to to be persuaded and to respond. Um, I I tend to focus an awful lot on what gives you hope. Is there really hope in this? Because when it comes my turn to give my presentation, I really emphasize the total assurance. It comes from knowing that Christ, you know, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And so now I can stand before God as pure as Jesus Christ. I mean, that's a shocker. But that's what John, 1 John 1, 9 implies. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive, to forgive us of, of uh, to, to, to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I focus an awful lot on just simply the confidence, the total assurance that comes to me from my faith, not in myself, 
not even in my church, not in our sacraments, not in anything else, but just in Jesus Christ. And because of that, I know, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to, to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. They can never say that. They can never say anything like that. Boy, if you want something that will generate hunger in them, that's the kind of thing to focus on. Uh, I find that the same thing with Jehovah's Witnesses. They've been taught you can never know for sure that you have eternal life until the end of this life. And I say, hey, 1 John 5, 14, 15, uh, 11 through 13 says, I've written these things to you, that you who, who believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have everlasting life. The Bible says you can know. Do you know? You know I, wanna, I wanna prick that hunger in these people. Okay. Uh, while we were adjusting the, uh, the cameras, one of you asked a question, how can people believe these crazy things? I mean, and really, some of them really are crazy. You know, first of all, I suppose if you read the tabloids and things like that, People magazine, you realize there's just an awful lot of really foolish people around. <laughs> you know, I guess nothing really surprises me anymore. But the explanation that I think fits especially well for Mormonism is this. It's what we find in Romans chapter 1, where Paul writes, beginning in verse 18, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, contrary to this whole Mormon notion that you know, God was, is an exalted man, he used to be like us, he, he got to be a God, and we have the chance to do the same thing. Obviously, therefore, God is finite. He's not truly the God of Scripture, right? Right? His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse for, although they knew God, every Mormon to whom you speak knows God. Scripture says this. Not knows in the sense of intimate covenantal relationship, right? but knows in the sense of is aware, recognizes that God is and that he is who he is. Every single Mormon to whom I speak knows that his God is a false God and that the true God is there. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Do the Mormons think that their God is in the image of, of birds and reptiles and animals? No, but they do think that he is just like us, right? They've changed the glory. They've exchanged the glory of the immortal, the incorruptible God for uh, an image made like corruptible, mortal man, right? And when you do that, scripture says you become a fool and God gives you over to a depraved mind. We wonder how they can believe these foolish things? That's it, that's it. Um, you know, when, when, we, when we grasp the beauties of scripture and its gospel, about its God and its Jesus Christ. We have something that we can bring to the Mormon or to any other cultist in contrast with what he thinks that is truly brilliant. You know, I, I think again and again to myself, you know, how can they have any joy, any hope out of this, out of their non-gospel? And that's why it's so important that we present the gospel really clearly and in stark contrast. And why do you think that jewelers display diamonds on a black velvet background? It's because that accentuates the brilliance of the diamond. 
by contrast, right? So also, as, as we witness to cultists, we should be accentuating the differences between the true gospel and the false gospels that they have and let that true gospel shine through as brilliant as it is. And you know, that's not only a good witnessing tactic for them, it is also a tremendously encouraging thing for ourselves. You never are more grateful for the truth of the gospel when you have just finished explaining it clearly to somebody who didn't get it. Right? And you realize what amazing love it is that thou, my God, shouldst die for me. 